Talk to us Basically, about the demand. Does it stay? Well, we haven't noticed any let up. There was a, a bit of nervousness in the market that, that people were storing up in March and early April. But frankly, we've only seen strength to strength. We would have the strongest June we've ever had. We're having a, a very strong uh, start to July. Uh, and we're reaching, you know, sort of 30 percent quarterly type growth uh, numbers for our business. So, you know, we have not seen this let up. And actually, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of new customers entering the market. In particular, we've seen older people coming to the cannabis market during this COVID period, experimenting with anxiety and, and sleeping issues and experimenting using cannabis to deal with those issues, whether it's edibles or lozenges or tinctures. They've been using a lot of different products in order to deal with some of the issues that they've been having during COVID. So, Boris, I mean, the big narrative uh, for the industry, uh, definitely back in 2018 and even into 2019, uh, was the continued uh, decriminalization and legalization of marijuana, whether for medical use or for recreational use. Uh, that was a trend that seemed to be taking place uh, across the globe, really, or at least in some of the major nations. Here in the U.S., it seems to kind of have uh, fallen outside of the sort of political uh, debate at this current moment. Where do you see regulation standing right now, and do you think there's going to be a significant shift uh, in regulatory policy towards marijuana uh, once we get through the U.S. election in November? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to separate, you know, what's been happening at the state level in the United States and what's been happening at the federal level. At the state level, we've seen both decriminalization happening across the board. We've seen uh, uh, medical uh, uh, um, uh, marijuana use uh, being allowed. We've seen uh, adult use being uh, adult use uh, uh, being allowed. So we're seeing tremendous amount of change. We've seen decriminalization. We've seen amnesties being given to criminals for cannabis use at the level of, of the state. So the states are liberalizing. They're doing it at the ballot box. And some states are actually trying now to do it at the legislature, like New York and Pennsylvania, um, in terms of moving to the adult use market. The federal government really has been in lockdown on this issue. I mean, they can't even get something as simple as SAFE Act, which would provide banking to the cannabis sector approved. Um, we, we're hopeful, um, you know, Vice President Biden came out yesterday uh, outlining his uh, policies on cannabis. He's made, uh, even though he's historically been anti-cannabis, he, he's made some movement in the right direction. He said that he would almost immediately uh, permit uh, and reschedule for medical purposes cannabis nationally. And then he said that he would move towards something called the States Act, which allows the states to determine their own future in terms of cannabis use. So similarly to the way the gambling world works in the United States, where the states make those decisions, he's, he's proposing approving that kind of federal legislation, giving the states the right to make their own determination on adult use. Mm. But he did say that he would approve medical use, and I think that's a huge step in the right direction. Boris, I cut my chops doing some background analysis on state and local budgets. And I remember some early adopters within the um, marijuana industry. Some states are really looking at it as a source of tax revenue. Now, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic and tax revenue and revenue shortfalls has been really in the news. How are you looking at states who are um, looking to legalize this as an additional source of revenue? I, mean, I, I wish, of course, that that wasn't the reason they were doing it. I wish they were doing it because it, it's much safer than alcohol. It has huge medical benefits, and it's the right thing to do. But the facts are the facts. The states have major uh, deficits in their budgets. They need revenues. Cannabis is a major revenue producer. No states that have legalized it for adult use purposes. And those budgets are big. The, uh, the tax revenues are contributing to those various states like Colorado, California, Oregon, Washington State, Massachusetts, and others. So I do think that as we see New Jersey in November go on the ballot, we think that it has the votes to pass. As we see Arizona in November on the ballot, and we think it'll pass there. You know, New Jersey is going to be a watershed event, because if New Jersey goes adult use, it is likely that both New York and Pennsylvania will be forced into that. And then Connecticut, obviously, because it borders Massachusetts. So by the time we're talking, if we talk again next year at this time, it's my view that we're going to have most of the East Coast in adult use. And then what will happen is that almost 80 percent of the population of this country will now have access to adult use cannabis by mid next year. At that point in time, I got to believe the federal government will have to act on 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 uh, on rescheduling cannabis. So clearly you're anticipating the market 
addressable market becoming ever larger. Is it therefore time to be splashing your cash right now, Boris? I know you've talked about opportunistic buying in terms of M&A for Curaleaf. Is that still on the agenda, particularly when does it matter which states these particular acquisitions are based in when we see COVID ripping so hard through some of the Sun Belt? Well, as you, as you probably know, we've been the most acquisitive company in the world in, in, in the area of uh, cannabis. Uh, in the United States, we have not broadened ourselves outside. We will be um, closing shortly uh, in the next week or so the largest transaction ever done in cannabis, which is the grassroots transaction, which will take uh, Cura Leaf to 24 states uh, nationally. It'll make us the largest cannabis operator in the United States, not only by footprint, not only by market cap, but by revenue, by a factor of two to three. Uh, and by profitability. And so this is a watershed transaction. All the conditions precedent have been met. We're anticipating a few last things like board meetings and shareholder meetings to take place next week. And at that time, we will close the grassroots transaction uh, shortly. And likewise, today we closed uh, Blue Kudu in Colorado. Uh, we're closing another transaction next week in Arizona. We have a lot of transactions that are closing during this period. And we've been using uh, the period of COVID and some of the difficulties in raising capital that other our competitors have had in this sector to double down on this sector during this difficult time. And we think that it's going to pay off in the long run. Do you think with regards to raising capital here with your relationship with whether it's banks or just outside investors in general, uh, what is that relationship like for you and other folks in the industry right now? Listen, our industry, you know, our, our cost, if you think about the, the speed at which we've grown, triple-digit annual growth rates. Most of the big U.S. operators are turning not only EBITDA positive, but net income positive this year and free cash flow generating. You know, if you were to put any metric of any other industry on these industries, you know, these companies would be, you know, $25, $30 billion companies. And the fact is, is that they're not. They're, they're trading at, you know, six to eight times, you know, forward multiples. And so I think that it's, it's, it's been, and, and that just shows you that it's been very difficult. It's been difficult to raise capital. It's been difficult to access capital on a basis that is economic. And so most of these companies are undercapitalized. In the case of Curaleaf, we've had the benefit of very strong shareholder base that's been prepared to support uh, our strategy and continue to fund that strategy going forward. And so we've been lucky. We did do the first a bond issue for the sector in January it was a three hundred million dollar issue, but you know it was at thirteen percent. It's hard to imagine that mm. you know we can make money at thirteen percent borrowing costs, but we anticipate that that's a short term issue. We think that borrowing costs will come down with regulatory change, particularly if Safe Act or States Act or any of these things that uh, Vice President Biden talked about yesterday. And even if Vice President Biden doesn't win the election, it's our view that. The Trump administration will not be able to ignore the fact that by this time next year, almost 80% of this country will most likely have access to adult use cannabis.